All right, then let's let's dive right in. Um, I wanna I wanna take you back uh, to your your teenage years first of all, like when you were a teen. Like how how was your how was your schooling like high school experience like? Um, and where were you by the way? Where were you uh, specifically? Okay, do you want me to start with high school or a little bit earlier? Even earlier would be fine. Oh, where you where you uh, grew up, kind of. Yeah, I had a very unusual uh, childhood, especially uh, in terms of uh, my you know early educational experience. Um, so. I was born in uh, Taiwan, um, and but my family moved away from Taiwan around you know when I was six and a half, and so um, we went to uh, Libya. Libya, you know, is in North Africa. Well, we moved to Libya, um, and uh, when I was eight years old, I uh, was my parents sent me to a boarding school in Malta. So, um, you know, so starting from eight years old, eight years uh, old on, that's when I started basically studying English. And it was a uh, British um, educational system. Malta had been a former colony of, um, of Great Britain. And so my parents felt that they wanted me to, um, you know, really, um, get an education in that used English in the English system. And so they sent me to this boarding school uh, when I was eight. Um, and I was at that boarding school for, for uh, five years. Um, so yeah. eight to 13, you were in Malta in yeah. a boarding school. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I really have to credit that experience for giving me a, a very strong educational foundation. Uh, as you know, you know, the British educational system is pretty rigorous. And, um, you know, from very early on, they already essentially prepare you for either the A, uh, the a level or O level, it's called. And, uh, right. So this school, you know, was already from a young age preparing us for eventually uh, attending university. So quite, quite um, rigorous. And uh, I remember even when I was mm, maybe 10 years old, I was already studying, um, you know, French as a foreign language. So really, you know, grateful for that experience. And then um, for um, what grade? Eighth and ninth grade, um, I went back to Libya and attended a, an American day school. And that day school was called the Oil Company School. And uh, you can probably guess why it's called the Oil Company School. Yep. Because all the Americans in Libya work for the oil companies. And so, you know, all those American families needed a school that their kids could go to. So that's how this school was uh, formed. And so from that point on, I started getting a taste of the American educational system, you know, and which is also at that school quite, quite good, quite solid. Um, but that put me on track to not go into the British university system, but more towards, you know, looking to America for my future education. So when I was in 10th grade, uh, that's when my parents sent me to a, a boarding school in the US. Um, the school is called St. Andrew's School in uh, Delaware. Uh, so Delaware is a small state and the school was also very small about total of only 260 students. This is a high school, um, you know, from, wow. from uh, ninth grade to 12th grade, only 260 students. And uh, all the students there was co-ed and all the students there were uh, uh, basically residential. You know, uh, everyone lived at the, on campus. Um, and again, I was incre incredibly fortunate. Um, I was able to get a very generous scholarship because you know my parents couldn't really afford a private boarding school. 
completely. So um, there was. I have a small. I have a small question. Just can I just stop you for a second? Here? Uh, mm -hmm. What uh, first of all, going back to your Malta experience, what was it about? How do you think Malta and just this constant flux of moving from one place to the other for you? Uh, you know, specifically because you went from Libya to Malta as well. How did that, you think, shape you as a person? Uh, you know, that, that going from one place to the other. And what did you learn from Malta specifically as well? Yeah. Um, so when I first started going to that boarding school in Malta, I was only eight years old. Um, and I did not speak a word of English. And so it was really just uh, being put in a very unfamiliar environment, having to learn to you know, pretty much fend for myself, you know, at a very young age. So it was very formative um, in terms of um, cultivating a sense of independence. You know, when you're eight years old and you're separated from your parents, you're at a boarding school. I mean, there were other kids there, of course, but you really had to learn to grow up very quickly, you know, to take care of yourself, to, you know, to... Um, uh, also motivate yourself, you know, in terms of the things that you want to do. Um, and then the other challenge was, of course, you know, having to learn a new language from scratch in a very um, unfamiliar environment. Uh, but when, you know, when you're young, it's not as hard um, to learn a new language uh, as, you know, when you're much older. Uh, so, it was pretty, you know, I would call baptism by fire uh, <laughs> that kind of experience. So very, very formative, I think, in shaping my, um, you know, my self-reliance, my sense of independence. And then also, in, you know, very important because, um, as I said, it was a very good education. And, and I think even from that point on, it made me appreciate um, what a good education can do. Um, uh, and, is it? Is it? Sorry. Is it? Is it? Is it that you you look at that time as the time you actually gained a lot of knowledge and and you know just ed, a good education because did the was there a difference between the British system and then as you went back to the American system you were like you know why this is such a different quality of education was it something like that that you noticed in, no, instantly I think, I think all the schools i went to offer the quality education you know maybe just a little bit different in terms of how the institutionally those systems were set up but they were all um very you know all provided a very solid education um and i would just say that you know in malta one of the really um you know, looking back, one of the really special things about being there, um, if you know where Malta is located, it's smack in the middle of the Mediterranean. And uh, it has, a for such a small place, it has an incredibly old and rich uh, history. Um, you know, tracing back to uh, St. Paul, who, according to, you know, the New Testament, was shipwrecked in Malta. And uh, you can even visit the beach, the cove where, where he, you know, the ship, um, the shipwreck took place, where he landed. Um, and then, of course, you know, moving on to the Romans, to the, um, uh, you know, to the, the Arabs, you know, who control the island, uh, to the Crusaders, and then to the Ottoman Empire, and then to the British Empire. So I just think that, you know, in, in a very um, um, coincidental way, I was in a place that really was the hub of um, a cultural synthesis of many, many different cultures. And uh, I would like to think that in some ways um, that really fits in with my role as uh, teaching in MMW, you know, because I was at a place that basically was a physical manifestation of, of um, cultural synthesis. And in MMW, as you know, we deal with so many different cultures. And I just think that from very early on, it made me appreciate, um, you know, the diversity of cultures and, and made me interested 
you know, and learning more about different cultures. Like I wasn't, I didn't grow up with a provincial perspective on the world, you know, just focusing on the local. I, I think it was um, ingrained in me, you know, to think of the world in a very cosmopolitan and global sense. Uh, which is which is rightfully so how the world has been as well, right? I mean, everywhere there's always been a there's not a single place that has that has had a very very single perspective in terms of who who came there, who conquered that place, how what kind of a, uh, an interaction that happened between different cultures. All places have had that global interaction kind of. Mm-hmm. Is it just now? It's just now that we have created all these nations as well in the the, the, the same That's time, right. you know. Yeah. Um. And uh, so the, then you were in. You said you were in the U.S. Uh, in Delaware. Mm-hmm. And so then, could you go on from there then? Uh, that was during 10th grade, you said? 10th grade? Yeah, so from uh, 10th grade to uh, 12th grade, uh, I was at that school. And um, so, as I mentioned before, it's a very small student population. But it also meant um, that each of our classes was very small. So none of my classes were ever ever had more than 12 students in it. You know, it was always maximum of 12 students. And we did not sit at desks. We didn't sit, you know, um, in desks. We sat all around what's called a Harkness table. Harkness table, you know, imagine a big oval wooden table. And um, that's how we learned. We, we learned by sitting around that table, uh, the teacher included. Um, and Everything was basically, especially in terms of history, you know, uh, literature, those kind of classes, even even in the, um, I think, you know, math and sciences, everything, um, the emphasis was always on the Socratic method, Socratic meaning question and answer. So we were never lectured to from an early point, you know, we always um learned through that socratic method uh learning to you know discuss and debate over issues that was my high school experience and is that something that you actively think about when you are teaching as well to have that question answer format in terms of in terms of lecturing when you lecture students yeah so um you know i try to incorporate that as much as i can but as you know, you know, all my classes are uh, generally 300 students or more. So it's, it's hard to replicate that, that type of approach. But uh, it does impact my teaching, even in a large lecture setting, because um, I put a strong emphasis on the interaction between the uh, professor and, and the students. Um, you know, more kind of back and forth, more kind of asking them questions, and then also um, addressing questions. You know, I really welcome students to ask me questions in the middle of the lecture. I don't, I, I've never felt offended or, or somehow um, that someone was interrupting me when they, you know, put up their hand and, and asked me to clarify or, or take an opposing view because that's how I learned. Um, and so even though I'm in a large lecture setting, I do try to bring that ethos of, of learning you know, to that large setting too. Yeah, all of that has a lot to do with my educational background. That's amazing. Um, my next question is, so where, can you, can you pinpoint a specific instance or, you know, a moment where you really realize that, you know, you want to go in into history and that as a career path. Like, can you, do you have, do you have a, like a moment of realization or was it just all these small moments that built up to this idea that, you know, you wanted to go into this, into this field? Oh, was this the field that you even wanted to go into in, in the beginning? Um, so you mean like specifically, specifically going into teaching? So, yeah, my question is, what, what do you think? Maybe this is a better way of framing it. What do you? What was your? Uh, what were your aims before, or like, uh, what was your career choice or career goals in your in your mind before during yeah, this time? Yeah, yeah. First of all, I just wanted to clarify, you know, that um, I'm not a historian by training. Um, 
as an undergraduate, you know, I did major in history, um, but I also uh, majored in international relations. So in, co in college, um, oh, by the way, so we're moving on to my college experience. So I went to a small liberal arts college in New England called uh, Tufts University. Um, and I went there because Tufts um, has, has always had a great reputation in international relations. You know, it was actually one of the first um, uh, universities or colleges to, to offer that as a major. And so that was a pretty obvious choice for me in terms of where to go. And so oh, I. Oh, one second. Sorry, one second. Uh, what was, why was it an obvious choice? So maybe even going back to that, um, when did you realize that you wanted to be in an environment which was just like in, in that international relations? Did you already have that within like high school? You realized that's what in you wanted high to be school, doing? I, in high school, I was uh, really drawn to uh, history, right? I was really drawn to. Um, uh, you know, international affairs you know, uh, in the classes where we discuss those issues. And then also because of my own, you know, international background, I felt that would be a pretty natural fit for me. And so um, I applied to college with that intent, you know, to really focus on international relations and then also to maybe in terms of a career choice, you know, one day work for um, the State Department um, or maybe, you know, some kind of uh, international development agency. So because of my own very international background, you know, I was definitely, um, I definitely gravitated towards that, you know, that same area. So, so I went to Tufts with that intent. Uh, um, wanting to focus on, you know, international relations and then just kind of uh, taking on a history as a, as a double major. But all the while, I actually took tons of uh, literature classes too. So I, would, I, you know, I was probably like one credit away from a triple major in, <laughs> uh, in English literature because that was my passion too. So I took courses based on what my passion was. Now, one passion that I did not have uh, was for math. <laughs> so so I, I, you know, I always joke to not, it's, I mean, I joke, but it actually was true. Um, I failed a class in college and that class was calculus. And um, I completely deserved, fa you know, to fail that class <laughs> because I actually never showed up to class. I just <laughs> to take take the final, <laughs> and I, it, I took it pass fail and failed. Took it, and, so you know I think that was a sign to me <laughs> and to others maybe that it was just that that's where not 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 where my forte lies uh, or where my interest lies. Um, so what happened, um, uh, Sarthak, is very interesting in terms of my. Uh, educational or career ambition. So as I said, I went to college wanting to focus on interna international relations, which, you know, which I did, I got the major, but something happened during my junior year. Cool. Okay. And that was um, two courses that I took with a professor in the history department. His name, uh, you know, uh, was, his name is Peter Wynn. And he was a very renowned historian uh, on Latin American history. So I took colonial Latin American history with him and I took modern Latin American history with him. And those courses basically completely shattered my illusions about what I wanted to do. What was it, what was, what was about it that, that shattered you? Yeah, great, great question. It was um, basically, so this was, I went to college in the 80s, right? So this is in the time of the Reagan administration, in the time when uh, we were very much involved, you know, in many Latin American countries, especially supporting regimes and um, 
abusing all kinds of human rights. Um, so basically what these courses um, exposed to me was our position and our approach to human rights in the Latin American world. And uh, by, by, by us, you mean America, the United States of America? American okay. foreign policy, okay. American foreign, you know, okay. supporting brutal dictatorships, you know, always being on the wrong side of the people, um, all always on the wrong side of, you know, social uh, reforms, uh, land reforms, and, and, and uh, you know, just the wrong side of, of freedom and of liberty. So a lot of these things became apparent to me. I was, I was kind of naive, I think, you know, prior to that. Um, I just thought, well, it wouldn't be great to, uh, to you know, promote American values and uh, you know, American democracy to the rest of the world. Um, but, but those two courses and this professor essentially opened my eyes, you know, to what, what we really were doing. You know, in especially not just in Latin America, but also you know in Southeast Asia and, and elsewhere, in the Middle East. Um, so you know, I, I think I became much more um, skeptical of what America's policy goals are, and I didn't really, you know, feel in good conscience that's what I want to go into anymore. All right, and that that happened to coincide with. Uh, also kind of a newly acquired passion, really, really strong passion for writing poetry. And so by my senior year, I was working with uh, Philip Levine, you know, who, who at one point was a, a poet laureate um, of, of the United States. So a really, really wonderful poet, but better than that. I mean, just a incredibly um, uh, devoted teacher. Uh, so Philip Levine, as you know, the poet, he took me under his wings and uh, basically, you know, all I wanted to do by my senior year was to write poetry. That's, that's the only thing I wow. want to do. There's no linear path at all that I took. Uh, that's very fascinating i mean i mean it, it kind of i mean looking at your your even from beginning your education i mean it's it's all never been linear seems like it's it's all been all over the place and <laughs> somewhere some somewhere it manifests and it manifests itself even in in the way you choose chose your careers and stuff but my other question was um what is it about what kind of poetry were you into oh uh, what, what was it yeah, um, so I come, of course, from an immigrant experience, um, and uh, there were many, many challenges and hardships that, you know, I saw my parents go through as immigrants, and uh, which I also uh, saw reflected in the overall, you know, immigrant experience. And so there's just a very strong on my part to, to, um, to give testimony to that to that experience you know but in a way that was uh poetic in a way that was um i hope you know poignant um and not kind of superficial or or just um you know kind of uh, very um tailored for hollywood you know that kind of approach but something that really delves into the the hard heart of the matter, you know, in terms of what so many immigrant families have to go through to to survive in this in this country. And um, now Philip Levine, my mentor, was the voice also of the working class. So he wasn't, you know, he wasn't an immigrant himself. His his probably his grand his grandparents were. Um, but he wrote a lot from the point of view of the working class. Um, so before he had become a poet himself, he worked for many years, you know, in, in factories in Detroit. Um, and so we, the two of us had 
a lot in common. I think that's what he saw, you know, in my poetry, that I was not writing from kind of a, just a privileged elitist point of view, that um, my voice was more of um, kind of a, a voice for the voiceless, if you will. Um, it's really, it's really interesting you say that because, uh, you know, you, right before that, it seems like you had this moment where you realize after taking the classes in history of Latin America, like in that classes, you realize that there were certain policies or just the way U.S. was generally handling uh, everything around them was uh, kind of very, very uh, discriminatory and also just, you know, not right for, for uh, you know, in a positive way. And, and then you go on you know, the opposite direction where you now go on the other side and now you're writing poetry for the people who may be oppressed. Mm. Uh, like, like that, that, uh, that is like a, like a 180 degree switch kind of, you know, like maybe, yeah. maybe. Yeah. I think my, you know, my values remain pretty consistent. It's just uh, the, the medium that I use, you know, to pursue those values, to understand those values. Uh, I think that's what changed. Um, but, you know, just in terms of um, being concerned about injustice and, and struggles, um, inequality, you know, those, those, those values, I think, were very much um, um, inculcated in me, I think, in my high school experience in the school that I went to. Got it. Well, so, so then I, I want to kind of switch then more to the side of teaching then. How, how did you get from there into teaching? Great question. Yeah. So, um, as I said, in my senior year in, in, in college, all I wanted to do was, uh, was to write. And, you know, there was one point I thought about applying to, graduate school for you know for international relations or foreign affairs um but i i dropped those plans and instead i was looking firmly at applying to um creative writing programs mfa programs you know master of fine arts programs um to continue to pursue my writing and um and philip levine because of the tremendous influence that he has um you know he i he 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 could almost single-handedly make sure that i i end up in a good program <laughs> that's that's how that's how much support you know he gave me um but i didn't go i didn't want to go straight into and, and by the time i kind of uh understood those that uh became sure about the shift in plans. It was, it was already too late to apply to grad schools. So I was looking at a gap year. I was looking at a year where I, I just wanted to keep writing and then... Uh, uh, this was when? This would, well, what year would this be? This was... Uh, so this is my, still my senior year. So in college, right? So I'm, 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 I'm thinking what I wanted to do for, for that year after college. Um, cause there was too late to apply to any writing programs. And I probably wasn't ready to go right back to school anyway. So what I was thinking, I was, I was seriously thinking about going to a place like, um, Alaska, you know, and, and working in a, in a, uh, fishery, you know, like a, some, some kind of, and then just write on the side, <laughs> some, uh, some really, really different experience, you know, to kind of put me um, um, smack in the face of, of real life, how people, real people <laughs> make a living. Um, so that was my plan. But then there was a, um, I remember vividly, there was a alumni gathering, alumni gathering, you know, for my high school up in Boston. And uh, the headmaster of my, um, of my, high school was there at that event and we just started to chat and he asked you know how i was doing and then he asked me like what were what were my plans for after college and i said you know i probably want to go to a program where i can write but um 
immediate, you know, in terms of immediate short-term plans, I didn't have any, you know, other than to just uh, go somewhere and, and work and, and write at the same time. And so right on the spot, he said, why don't you come back to um, our school? You know, your, my, my alma mater. And he said, um, you can come back here and, and, and write. Um, actually, he said, you know, you can go there and teach. Come back there, go back there and teach. I said, yeah, but I really just want to write. Um, I don't, I don't want to spend most of my time teaching. And he said, I'll create a position for you where you can do both. How's that? <laughs> so, so he basically created a position which uh, it's called poet in residence so wow. i would teach some courses coach some sports uh proctor the dorms you know but <laughs> all the while having time to to pursue my writing so that sound you know that sounded like a good good compromise uh, because i wouldn't have to worry about you know rent or anything like that it's just everything's provided for you there um housing so when you sorry sorry when you were when you were when you were writing then when you're writing poetry was it uh, was it politically fueled poetry was no. it it no. was it, it was all just from the eyes of the oppressed is that what it was like well i wouldn't say oppressed but uh the eyes of uh people who from you know talking about the experiences of 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 um people who face just adversity in everyday situations and different challenges on a daily basis just to survive. Yeah. I wouldn't call it oppression. No, because yeah. I would be lying if I said I was oppressed somehow. I wasn't, um, you know, we, we came here and we had to work hard. Um, we had to struggle, but you know, we also, there was, there were opportunities, you know, for us especially for myself, you know, being so lucky to have uh, access to such a good education, um, even with li family, limited family resources. Oh, I would be, the last thing I would call myself is oppressed. <laughs> yeah, I have no, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, there are people in the world who are truly oppressed. I was not. So mm -hmm. it would be uh, disingenuous on my part to say I was writing for the oppressed. I, would, I, I, had, I had no right. Um, but I was writing about um, just kind of genuine, genuine struggles that people have to, you know, uh, overcome as immigrants. Okay, and so then, so then you went ahead with your with your teaching there, and how? So well, then how did you end up from there uh, uh, to U in UCSD then? Um, so from teaching in high school yeah so after that one year of teaching as a, a, a as a poet in residence you know then i went to get my mfa um you know i went to the university of iowa's uh, writers workshop and got my mfa there um and uh just you know as an, an another example of the non-linear path <laughs> that's always uh kind of define my pursuits um, is that while I was uh, focusing on my poetry, you know, writing, you know, writing um, uh, kind of more creatively, um, I also ended, started to take a lot of classes on classical Chinese because I wanted to, to um, retrace my own heritage you know, I wanted to learn to embrace and appreciate my own heritage, uh, something that I didn't have a chance to do throughout my childhood. You know, I've always had a more Western education, and I really didn't really know much about my own Chinese cultural heritage. And so um, something in me just wanted to pursue that. And I got hooked on that, too. So I got hooked on uh, classical Chinese poetry, you know, and, and classical Chinese philosophy. Um, and basically, I became uh, uh, interested enough in that, that I went to Taiwan for a year or two to basically study classical Chinese so I can read all, you know, read all these uh, ancient texts, Whoa. classical texts. And um, that's the path that basically... Put, uh, took me to 
uh, a PhD, PhD program at uh, UCSD. So I ended and up. I, yeah, I do see. I do see that you. I I did see your dissertation on uh, at, at UCSD on uh, aesthetics of Wu. Right? Yeah, yeah. I saw that. Um. Well, well, so my question is, I just if I just go straight into now the UCSD side of things, like when you when you ended up being in UCSD and you're writing this dissertation, mm -hmm. um, how, did you always were you always interested in in philosophy as well? Like in the concepts, these these classical concepts in philosophy. Um. Yeah. So I was in the literature program, but uh, the literature program at UCSD, the you know the PhD program, uh, was pretty flexible. You know, in terms of how we uh, wanted to approach uh, our research, and so rather than being focused more on actual literature. I became more interested in the, you know, kind of the philosophical side of things, the, the theory side of things. So I was in the comparative literature department, but I think what I ended up doing mostly was comparative philosophy. Um, because while I was in Taiwan, um, aside from studying classical Chinese, I also became really, um, uh, interested in, in uh, classical Chinese philosophy, especially Taoism. Okay. Especially Taoism, yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, so that was something, and, and it just, when I became, the more I learned about, about um, Taoism as a Chinese um, philosophy, the more I realized, oh my good, goodness, you know, this, this tradition in many ways was um, thousands of years ahead of what was known as the post-structuralist uh, movement or post-structuralism in, in the West. So in the 20th century, you know, you have the deconstruction and the, and the Foucaults and so on, you know, decon uh, the post-structuralism. And a lot of what they were saying um, in terms of criticizing the hegemony of, of discourse, um, those were already evident in Taoist philosophy. So I was incredibly fascinated by, by that. Okay, so so it's very interesting because, uh, I mean, I, I kind of have been going back into understanding, since I come from India, I, I did not really have a very strong, like, I did obviously know a lot about my heritage because I, I've been I've been living there for the last 18 years. But then I recently over the last one year started going more into just understanding the culture within India because even that is thousands of years old. I mean, that culture is one of the oldest civilizations to exist, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's really fascinating because uh, you do see a lot of what's already written there kind of just republished in, in different ways in, you know, in our in our modern kind of times. Mm -hmm. All the philosophical stuff being talked about now, mm -hmm. it was always there in some shape, way, or form in Taoism mm -hmm. or even in the Vedic literature. Uh, like all of them have very interesting things to say, uh, mm -hmm. I feel like, about all these things, right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's that was um, uh, in many ways, you know, the, the reason for my uh, fascination. In so it started with just wanting to. Uh, embrace my own heritage, but then it developed into, wow, there's a lot more to that heritage than I realized. And uh, there's a lot, you know, that I can actually share and, and understand more thoroughly, you know, um, uh, as a, as a academic, but also as a teacher. So, you know, those, all those things turn out to be a perfect fit for teaching an MMW because, you know, when it comes to those um, ancient philosophies and, and uh, religious traditions, you know, those are all things that, that um, I have some uh, background in. Right. So then, I mean, my next question then goes into MMW, um, since I, that's how I even know of you is from you teaching me in two different classes within MMW. For mm -hmm. people and listeners who don't understand what uh, or don't know about MMW, how would you describe this program 
like how would you describe this program as and also what was what do you think according to you is the intention behind it as well yeah so as you know you know the 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 way we promote the program in a in brochures you know in a very kind of public way is is cultivating global citizens right um and and i do think that is uh true to the purpose of the program but then we have to look deeper into what does it mean to truly cultivate a global citizen um and that's where i think mmw um is really exceptional uh, there are many programs in uh, around the country around the world that profess to cultivate so-called global citizens you know awareness of different cultures and so on um, but i think mmw is in many ways um, exceptional because given the the you know the the extent of the sequence i mean we ask you to take five five quarters of this yeah you know, most other schools at at best it would be two semesters two quarters you know one course two courses at best but we ask you to do five <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's not and and uh it's not just you know the the duration of the sequence it's it's what can ha- be done what can happen what can be achieved when you have you know uh the breadth of that that sequence that that we do um so here is a key difference to um what we do that i don't think is always um replicated you know in maybe other programs around the country um MMW, in terms of our approach to cultivating the global citizen, it doesn't mean just presenting you with a bunch of exotic facts or details, names and dates of uh, other cultures throughout history. It doesn't mean that. Actually, our, um, our approach to cultivating a global citizen is providing all of you with a perspective to see the world from multiple angles. So when we study ancient China, when we study ancient India, or when we study you know, the Islamic world, we are trying to get you guys to see how to appreciate and to understand how people from those cultures see their history and, and the world around them. So it's, it's not treating, you know, those cultures as objects of study, but instead it's actually inhabiting, inhabiting their uh, vantage point. Do you think, do you think it's really hard for people to do that nowadays because of, you know, everyone has their pre-existing notions about a lot of things, right? Is it really hard, do you think, for people to uh, understand someone else's perspective or even understand historical perspective in that sense? Um, it's, yeah, I think it's, for, it's hard for people who don't take this program. But I think, you know, if you, if you are in ERC and you go through the sequence, it's inevitable that, you know, this is assuming that you don't do any work at all, right? Like if you don't do any work at all, then there's nothing we can do. But if you at least try to engage, try to engage uh, what we present you with, um, it's inevitable that you will get a get a taste, you know, get a glimpse of of how other cultures see themselves and also how they see, you know, uh, the outside world. Um, It's inevitable. Why? Because we give you so many primary sources that you have to read. It would be one thing if all we assigned were just textbooks, right? Western scholars talking about the Bhagavad Gita or something (laughs) like that. We make you read the Gita. Right. Yeah, parts of it, which is very, very interesting. I mean, uh, that is really interesting. But I, I feel that when people especially majority of us, the students who come into college, when they're coming into college, they're not coming with the intention of 
majority of people don't come with the intention of knowing more about different cultures but rather so focused on their own discipline that they're trying to pursue right yes and so my the the thing that i've noticed most is that majority of people have had this outlook towards this specific course that is in some way uh, you know negative because they they think that this is kind of a, a little bit of a roadblock in their actual pursuit of what they want to be doing mm-hmm. and what would what would you say to someone any of these students who are right now taking mmw are uh, the part of it or people who have already taken it like especially for people who are now taking it what would you mm-hmm. say to them in terms of you know just changing their perspective about this specific course and you know making them kind of feel just make this course more appreciative uh, in their heads and also make it something that's enjoyable rather than a compulsion you know mm-hmm. yeah well, what would you say no, to them there's no de- denying that uh, they most you know most most students at ERC were forced into this situation this was yep. not by choice Uh, there are yeah. some there are some that actually chose ERC because of MMW but that's a very very small uh, minority of students we know that you know yeah. so we know that uh, you guys were thrown into this situation um, you know with not be you know beyond any uh, uh, it was not a choice of of your own yeah so um we you know we we understand that but at the same time um as a program and this includes the director to all the professors that teach in it we also deeply believe that what we're offering is something useful to all of you no matter what your career plans are no matter what major you know you are pursuing uh as you know i mean majority of students at UCSD and ERC you know you guys are stem majors and this is mm-hmm. really not you know something that um you plan to to pursue professionally right uh, yeah. or academically at any point so we know that but then why is it that we still insist that you do the sequence so for one personally i mean when i was young and i kind of still am i've always been kind of more on the rebellious side. I hate to be told what to do and I also hate to tell other people what to do. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But um I believe in this because I think the intangible intangible uh uh benefits are the reason why you know we ask you to do this. Now what are those intangible qualities? You know, intangible uh benefits. Um no matter what career you pursue think of the tremendous advantage that each of you will have if you living in this globalized world if you just are able to show more sensibility uh sensitivity i'm sorry as well as understanding of where other people are coming from so you could be an engineer you could be a doctor you know if you're a doctor and you're treating someone you know from a certain cultural background imagine the difference that it would make if you were able to better relate to that person's heritage culture customs values than your average you know physician and and you know i can keep on listing all kinds of examples but so it's about those intangible qualities and then also in terms of you know your own um your own um um how should i put this your your essence as a human being um yeah you know so that it's not just your career that defines who you are but it's all these um many different aspects uh of what you understand what you're curious you know curious about um what you you know for the for the rest of your life that you're you want to learn more about so it's like planting that seed of curiosity too um that will 
I believe enrich everyone's life if they if they learn to appreciate that. It, it is maybe the fact that uh, you know people cannot connect the dots while taking that class that this could be something personally beneficial to them even in any other field and sphere of their life. Mm-hmm. That that may be why they just think of it in like one streamlined way. But coming to your specific style of teaching as well, in terms of have you ever have you ever looked at any of the reviews that you get on Rate My Professor and all those websites? Have you heard of you've heard of Rate My Professor, right? Yeah, I'm 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 aware of it, but um, you know, I I don't I don't you know I don't really follow it. Uh, I know that people, you know. Um, you know, people say good things, people say <laughs> negative things, but yeah. I take it with a grain of salt because, uh, um, you know, it's people are always entitled to mm-hmm. res- to comment and to respond in whatever they, they way they want. Uh, yeah. I do look at the UCSD Cape Cape reviews because, uh, you know, those things I think are more informative. Um, they help me. Um, improve my own teaching you know maybe there's something that i overlooked maybe there's things that i said that people took the wrong way and you know so i always have the opportunity to improve to you know make uh, to make sure that whatever i say is, is clearly conveyed right and but even when people think the good or the bad things the majority of i just went through them you know the majority of reviews that people even have on something like read my professor are you know you being an amazing lecturer you being inspirational you being you being inspirational and i don't know i don't know if you actively are even thinking in that direction to just be inspirational because you are just in the end storytelling in some way right you are telling us a complete story of of the history of how we have come to this place and understanding different perspectives but my question is more about um uh, specifically about uh uh, the amount of reading that you give in in your classes normally in MW. Um, so, what is the intent behind most people? Most people think that it's a lot of reading. Most students say, you know, they're like, "This is too much reading." That's the one thing that they all say. What is the intent behind a lot of volume in your in the content that you give for your lectures and through MMW? Um. Yeah. So you know, the question of what's a lot is always relative. Um, so I guess the, I guess mostly mostly the most students consider that to be uh, relative to other professors more reading at least within MW. Um, um, yeah, is there any specific reason for it? Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, um, some some might give more, some might give less. Um, but you know, I know that relative to let's say what I used to, you know, what most of us used to assign uh, 10 years ago, you know, it's a lot less. So wow. yeah, the, I've probably reduced the, the required reading amount by uh, over a third of what I used to assign. And, not, and that wasn't just what I used to assign, what the program, you know, all the professors in the program used to assign. So um, if you look at any reader, let's say from 20 years ago, they were on average twice the size of what we have now. That's fascinating. Well, <laughs> so as I said, you know, what's a lot is always relative. Uh, I, agree. I think uh, 20 years ago, perhaps there weren't as many distractions, you know, to students' time and attention as there are now um so you know it's it's what do you choose uh you choose to go on youtube watch <laughs> some um, clips on youtube or you know you're going to or are you going to devote more time to reading this actually connects to one of the questions um that i have which is as you talk about even you've seen students from before from over 20 years ago as you're saying like uh, across time you've seen how uh, the student you you've been uh, actively dealing with students and and talking to them on a daily basis. So, what is something that you see? Uh, the how has how the how the students changed in terms of their uh, how how has that perspective changed across this decade or so since you've been teaching? How do you see the students 
how the how they shape now uh, how are they now versus 10 years ago for example is there like a difference between the attitude and the way they are i think i mean a a a really important change can be attributed to uh just the the change in you know in technology with uh social media um you know in terms of where people get the source of their information and um and uh you know their exposure to issues um i think uh there's certainly a lot more access and exposure these days to you know all different sources of of information um but you know the problem that i'm seeing which we all face and it's not just students but um you know people of any age um and even social economic background for the most part is that um the problem in society today is not that there is not enough information but there is too much misinformation so we all have access to different sources of information but the big concern that uh, i have and i think many people um you know in academia might have is the amount of misinformation that is out there today and it it affects not just young people not just students but um you know people of all ages um and all you know different backgrounds so sarthak i mean what what education partly is trying to do is to address you know that crisis of misinformation what can we do to make sure that fewer people are susceptible you know to the um you know the amount of mis- misinformation out there um i right. think education actually plays a big role in what you know what how much that can impact us right and we see that from this year itself how much fake news as you would say and misinformation has caused a uh, ruckus around the country itself within us and everywhere else so my next question to you then would be uh, as you know that this election uh, in the us has been it's for most people most people consider this to be a very important election and it just happened a short while ago what what do you think uh, according to you what is what makes a great leader um yeah so that that kind of shifts our focus a little bit because i i would like to come back maybe a little bit later to this idea of you know how to combat misinformation but right. uh, to answer your question um i certainly think that um we do not have many current examples of great leaders <laughs> uh, around the world um there are of course a few notable exceptions um you know i think the prime minister of of new zealand um you know uh is a, is a i think she's a uh quite uh, exemplary figure but but let me talk about some you know some figures that uh in 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 you know from the past that uh i believe for you know for my in my own personal bit, uh, opinion possess um exemplary qualities of a leader so one i mean and i don't mean to be cliched about this but i really truly believe that um you know mahatma gandhi is a really good example of what a modern leader should be um and so why do i choose him um i mean you can choose him for many different reasons but from my perspective if you read gandhi's autobiography mm-hmm. um you know i think I, and i think a lot of people should read that especially if you have aspirations to be a modern day leader and to to be a you know to have some positive impact i think people should read that closely um what really stands out to me about mahatma gandhi is how self critical he was of mistakes that he made and not being shy about admitting his faults um so to me that 
that underlying quality that, you know, kind of uh, behind all this is his basic um, humility. He does not see himself as perfect. He did not see himself as infallible. And he did not associate power and authority with infallibility. So right. he was willing to be modest and humble and honest and um, use that as the, as the basis of his moral authority. So to him, it's, you know, to me, it's, it's uh, what makes him a great leader is that very human personal quality. He definitely is one of those figures, especially being in India, you always, he is a larger than life figure in India anyways. Uh, you just see him everywhere in all kinds of places. You hear about him. We've read, him, read about him all the time in history textbooks. And uh, so now if we go back to your, the, the question on misinformation, right? So do you, do you consider that to be the biggest issue that the USA faces? As a, as a I, think, I think in many ways, yes. If you look at you know the recent trend in politics and then the polarization of our country, um, you know I think a lot of it can be attributed to just the amount of mis misinformation out there, especially you know through social media. I mean, think about how much Twitter and Facebook uh, now. I mean, they're kind of uh, very late in in reckoning with this. But just those platforms, how how responsible, how much responsibility they bear for the dissemination of misinformation. Uh, now, those you know, social media is also responsible. You know, I have to admit for a lot of useful information, making us all more aware. But the 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 key thing then is not so much what social media can present us with because I do not believe in censorship. I do not believe that there should be some sensorial board, you know, governing what can be, you know, posted or what cannot. It, you know, that, that would make us a, you know, a kind of a dictatorial state. Yeah. If there is a, some kind of a sensory board like that. So the answer is discernment. Discernment on our part, that we need to have the analytical skills and aptitude to be able to discern what can be trusted and what cannot. How would you do that? How would you do that? <laughs> so this comes back to your very first question about why we even assign readings, right? Uh -huh. um, the reason we assign readings is to cultivate that critical analytical uh, uh, aptitude, uh, the acumen that you have to discern, uh, no matter what your you know, personal opinions or values are, but at least to be able to see through, um, to ask the right questions, Sarfak. Um, I think you know, we, can, we can't always get to the bottom of what is true or what is false. Uh, things are not so black and white you know, when it comes to, especially with controversial issues. But it doesn't mean that we can't learn to write to ask the right questions. So I'm talking about a kind of um, critical or analytical skepticism, um, not to just, um, you know- Believe whatever is thrown at you. Whatever, especially if it happens to fit in with your own beliefs you know right right right, right, right up in that echo chamber so no matter where your politics lie you know we we have all become trapped in one degree or another in our own echo chamber mm -hmm. and and partly what traps us in that echo chamber is the inability to to discern um what is reliable and what is you know kind of more or less uh, party rhetoric. So depending on, you know, what, you know, what your party affiliation might be, or your political mm -hmm. views might be, um, we tend to easily absorb things that uh, resonate with us. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and just very quickly uh, dismiss 
whatever doesn't fit that, you know, that uh, narrative. So uh, I'm just trying to understand this a little bit more because although, yes, that is exactly the issue. The issue is that people normally tend to hold on to their own beliefs and using those beliefs, using that single perspective or that lens, they look at everything else in the world, right? Mm -hmm. how, how would you, to like a common man, on the streets who has this political system set up in his in his mind he has a very strong belief system how would you because now we're outside of mmw we are now just in in the real world where people have not had enough education you know about the history of the world or just like a, a more worldwide perspective of everything right how would you what would you say to a, a common person on or how would you educate a common person in this in this specific aspect then I, you know, sadly, I think that would be very difficult. I certainly would not know how to, how to educate, you know, um, someone, let's say, in his 40s or 50s that, that, you know, has very deeply entrenched views. Um, right. I mean, I, I wish I had the answer to that. But my job is uh, working with young people, you know, uh, students. And so I, I do think that, you know, in, in, the, in my capacity as an instructor, I can play some part. I mean, I have no illusions about what I can do, but at least I can have some part in planting the seed of um, inquiry and uh, critical skepticism, uh, that analytical discernment that I talked about. I, I can plant those seeds in the in the in the mind of my of my students. Uh, but as you say, for the common person, you know, um, just on on the streets in the suburbs, I I would not know where to begin, but. That doesn't mean that uh, we cannot converse civilly with each other. I do mm -hmm. believe we can. So in fact, Sarthik, um, my attitude now uh, towards those who have different views from my own is not to you know, kind of begin with the assumption that they need to be educated and I need to change their opinion. Uh, but instead, it is to learn to listen you know, I may, I may not agree with them at the end of the day, most likely I will not, but at least I can learn to be a better listener to, you know, to what, what they're thinking. And, um, you know, I think that's, that's, that's can, uh, you know, so we end up agreeing that we disagree, but at least mm -hmm. in a civil way. So to answer- That's huge. Yeah, That's to answer huge. your yeah. question, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, it's, I think uh, it's easier to work with um, young people, um, you know, our students who, um, you know, to teach them to really think carefully about what uh, they read and to discern, you know, uh, information that is valid versus invalid. But beyond that, I have no illusions about, you know, educating anyone else. That, that's a great answer. I, I would want to get to know what you think about. So taking into consideration how the youth are right now, how do you see, for example, 2030 to be like? Is there like a view that you have of the world in US? Or I would just say the world in general in 2030. Where do you see the world being? Uh, in the year 2030, like <laughs> <Now you laughs> it's a very futuristic me. question, but I I just wanted to ask you. In 2030, um, um, well, if we're going down the trend that we've been seeing lately, then I can't be too optimistic. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, um, but. It's also true that history often uh, proceeds in cycles. Mm -hmm. And so we may be going through another one of these cycles where 
we have this crisis uh, and something, you know, will come out of this crisis. I don't know what. Um, it could be terrible. It could be great. I don't know. But, but I, I do feel that we are in the midst of a, um, as a nation, you know, in the midst of a very unprecedented existential crisis. Um, right. And, and the hope, you know, the hope is really in, the, in young people, people your age, you know, what will, what will you guys be able to, to do? Uh, you know, to change the trajectory of this country. Uh, that's, that's what makes me get up every morning and go to the classroom and teach um, because of that hope. Um, the hope that the next generation will do better. Uh, and, and, and by better, I mean, you know, um, being kind of more, uh, less vulnerable to misinformation, right, to demagoguery, uh, that you guys can really maybe see through things more clearly. That's my hope. So what is, it, what is one advice that you would give to us, uh, to the youth? Would it, would it just be this, that don't just buy into anything that you see? Well, at this point, I think it, you know, you don't just wake up one morning and, and, and develop that ability, right? It's, right. not, it's not just something that uh, we're naturally endowed with, but like all things that are worthwhile, we need to work at it. We really need to work at it. And so what that means is that we need to, you know, learn to be better listeners, to really hear what the other perspective is. And then secondly, you know, we need to develop our own analytical uh, skills of discernment. Um, and that is, that is just like working out. You need to, you know, go to your mental gym and work out. <laughs> right. Um, and how do you do that? By constantly exposing yourself, you know, to challenging, difficult issues and arguments. And, and uh, Sarthik, um, you know, there's no way around it, but we have to read you know, we really have to read a lot more because not a lot of people are doing that, actually. <laughs> that is my point. And this goes back yeah. to what you're saying earlier. So with this course, you know, not that I just want to pile on an impossible amount of reading, but I have always believed that our path towards a true education is actually through reading. Think about the reading experience itself. It's one of the few quiet moments in your day where you sit there with a text and you simply reflect on the thoughts, you know, that are coming across the page. We don't have many moments like that in our life. Except for showering and stuff, you know, when you shower. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know how long your showers are. You well, know? <laughs> yeah, there are great thoughts that have come up, you know, in the shower, when you're sitting on the john. Yeah, great thoughts. <laughs> great thoughts have come up, you know, great ideas. But how much time do we spend, you know, in the shower or sitting on the john? You know, probably, right. you know, probably we shouldn't spend that much time. <laughs> but the other, other than that, the reflective, uh, the reflective opportunity in our life is really when we sit down with a text and just immerse ourselves in that engagement. You know, I always talk about it as relishing that moment of solitude that you have with a particular text. Um, it, you know, it's, it's not about cramming your head with things. It's about training a muscle. And that muscle is our muscle of discernment and analysis. So you know, if, you, if anyone agrees with me that we have to be more analytical, more skeptical, more discerning, how do we, how do we develop that skill we do it through reading i i completely agree with you and uh, speaking of reading what are what are like what are three book recommendations that you would personally give three books that you've read that have helped change your perspective or just made made you more positive in some way or just you know uh, affected you in a in a very uh, positive way mm -hmm. 
What what would three books be? Yeah, so I mean, um, um, you know, I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not just an Hindu file by nature. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned Gandhi when you asked me who's my uh, you know my my uh, model leader, um, but one of the texts that has really had a huge impact on me is uh, the the Bhagavad Gita, you know, just reading the Gita um, has really, really helped um, provide a direction for my life, you know, and uh, a grounding, you know, for um, how to deal with, you know, lots of conflicts and tensions and contradictions, you know, in life. So the Gita is one of them. And then, um, Another one is uh, actually uh, the Taoist classic, you know, by Zhuangzi. So it it really has informed my uh, my my Taoist way of seeing things. Um, and then thirdly is a more modern book. Uh, it is um, a novel uh, entitled The Overstory. It is by Richard Powers. I think it came out published maybe three years ago or so. And uh, it's a no it's you know it's a novel, but it is really a novel that um, um, illuminates our close connection to nature, and in particular with trees, with the life and the spirit of trees. So, um, you know, nature is a plays a very very strong part in my life. So I'm not all about books um, and. <laughs> an analysis um, I'm also about you know being in touch with our um, natural environment and uh, and even to the point of communing with nature on a very deep spiritual level uh, I believe those you know those kind of connections um, are very important in making us you know to to kind of uh harnessing the the humanity in us um, you think uh spirituality so you would you consider yourself to be spiritual very very spiritual all these think... all these three books i have mentioned are very spiritual are very spiritual books yeah so i i am probably more spiritual than your average academic well wow. okay that's awesome that's awesome i i too have been getting into that i think Spirituality can definitely get us in touch with our human emotions and definitely help in in all the stuff that you were talking about in helping people understand other people's perspective or not even understand, just listen to them better and, and deal with people better, which is, I guess, very well needed in this world right now. Yeah. And I, you know, I just want to add, you know, it's, it's the ability because um, I, um, I, this is something I'm learning, you know, because my tendency in the past has always been to uh, try to convince people of things, you know, to convert them to one, one thing or another, or to, you know, win them over, to educate them. Um, I no longer have that impulse. Um, I think you have to go into the, the practice of listening without an agenda. And that's really that's hard to learn to do. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn, you know, to learn to listen without an agenda. Yeah, listening with the intent to listen. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. What a question. I think this will be very, very powerful for a lot of listeners. Uh, all that you've said, especially for the youth, especially for the students that are listening to it, because they can grasp a lot. I have learned a lot right now from what you've said. I mm -hmm. think they can learn a lot from it as well. 100%. Yeah, it kind of puts the puts what they're what we're putting you guys through in context. <laughs> and so that's 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 uh, one of my key incentives for doing this is uh, the opportunity to explain to either people who've finished the program or who are in the program or even some that are about to perhaps you know uh, join ERC is mm -hmm. to put this whole sequence and what we do this curriculum in in a personal and human context. I hope the people who are coming in right now and taking MW in the first year are listening to this. This is, this is very important for them, I think. They can oh, definitely... Um, 
three, two things. What are what are the three biggest learnings that you've had from your life till now? What are three biggest learnings that you could give on and pass on to someone else that you've had <laughs> from your lessons from life? Yeah, yeah. Three, <laughs> three. I don't know if I I don't know if I have three, but um, um, stop three. Just stop three in your off the top of your head. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, I think one is that um that we should never succumb to failure. We should never succumb to setbacks and defeats. That, that in, in many ways, you know, if we can just be resilient and patient, that we can turn those defeats into op- new opportunities. That's one thing that I'm pretty convinced of, um, that we can turn setbacks and defeats into an opportunity. Um, And then like, you know, from the Taoist point of view, not to be too rigid in how we define things or how we perceive things. Uh, Taoism, you know, in the end is really about that flexibility of mindset um perspective um i don't know if you studied you know uh, zhuangzi the taoist philosopher with me but zhuangzi one of my one of his one of my favorite ideas of his is his idea of the fasting of the mind fasting so much of western education is about cramming knowledge and information in our head that we are most potent when our mind is actually fluid and empty. So, you know, I think it offers us an interesting way to think of, think about education. And then lastly, because I'm, um, you know, I'm also uh, uh, a Buddhist, um, I believe that the key lesson for all of us is to be able to show compassion or, you know, called Buddha nature uh, towards all sentient beings, all. So I don't, personally, I don't really distinguish the sacredness of a human life to that of, let's say, the life of an insect. Um, so I Absolutely. believe in those three things. Awesome. Maybe one last question sure. for you is... Uh... <laughs> This is a question that I've, I've been, been thinking, not thinking about actively, but it's one of those philosophical questions that I have to ask you because I see you're a very spiritual person, a very, very philosophical person as well. Um, what is it going to you, the meaning of life? The meaning of life. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a Buddhist, um, philosophically and also practicing Buddhist. And so as a Buddhist, I believe you know, that, um, you know, our existence is impermanent. We are here for just a fleeting amount of time. Um, We may return to the cycle of rebirth, right? Some of us, who knows, you know, we may have that moment of enlightenment that uh, takes us out of the cycle. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't live with that intent in mind. So because we are here on an impermanent and fleeting basis, to me, the meaning of life is what do we do with this time that we have here? Um, you know, it's, uh, I think it's about um, trying to make the most of it um, in a way that positively affect others. So make the most of it in a way that positively affect others. Now, what does that mean? I think, you know, we have to, to the best of our ability, you know, bring joy to those around us. Um, and, um, and, to, and to try to minimize suffering of people around us. So those two things go hand in hand you know, enhance the joy that people have in this life, as impermanent as it may be. And in the same process, of course, 
you know, uh, minimizing the amount of suffering and pain that people have to en endure. So that, that is my very humble <laughs> goal in life. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's really nice. It's a great goal to have. Thank you so much for your time again and sharing your thoughts, your ideas, and your perspective on this, on these, all these topics, all these different topics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope you have a great day. Have all a good right. one. Thank you, Sarthak.